Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the subject of today's webinar is um, back to basics, most commonly asked questions with yep. reference to specialist seating. Um, I'm joined today by my regular colleague, Rebecca, okay. Rebecca Dunster. My name is Les Jones. Just a little bit about housekeeping. Um, we are recording the session. We've started to record the session, so it's really quite important that you mute your mics and turn your videos off. That should be happening anyway. But just in case, please mute and turn the, uh, the video camera off. Technical, if you do have an issue, we tend to find the best way to resolve a technical issue is to leave the meeting and rejoin. It tends to reboot things. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. We've got quite a full agenda yeah. to try and work through this morning. We've yeah. got a slightly different format than the one we normally use. A bit more practical. Uh, we will share the presentation as well, but because we've obviously got limited time with you, um, we haven't answered the questions in depth. We're just going to go through some of the common seating solutions, but when we share the presentation with you, you'll get the full answers to all those most commonly asked questions. And, and if you have questions as we work through the presentation, if you'd like to use the chat feature, uh, if you want to post a question there, my colleague Jess, uh, who's monitoring the session for us as well, will pick up on some common themed questions, if you like. Uh, if you have a technical issue, again, if you want to post it in the chat feature, Jess will try to resolve any issue for you. So Rebecca is just going to move across to the first part of the presentation. Brilliant. Hopefully now everyone should be able to see that on your screens. Um, what, as Les said, what we're going to do, a bit of a mix, just go through a few slides, then apply that to the seating solution so you can physically see um, the chairs in action. We'll come back, introduce a bit more slides and go from there. Um, these are our most commonly asked questions that we have been asked over the past year, really going back to the basics. Um, but as I said, when you get a copy of the presentation, there'll be a lot more in-depth answers in there for you to read through and some references if you want to do some further reading as well. Um, now, we split it into four sections. We've got the chair functions and accessories, so the most common questions we get asked around those. The importance of chair setup. And the questions we get asked around specific conditions um, and also the questions we get asked around pressure care as well. So I think, first of all, we need to ask the most common question, the most um, fundamental question for today is what exactly is specialist seating? Um, now, it is critical to quality of life when we work with individuals um, who have um, where the ability to achieve good posture is affected whether that's through age, the illness, disease, disability, or injury, it can have a significant impact on their health and well-being. So specialist seating, in the simplest of terms, allows those individuals who might otherwise have difficulty to achieve their optimum sitting posture. So where those individuals, because of specific, specific diagnosis or postural presentations, they simply can't sit in standard seating, um, so we need to support them through seating solutions to be able to achieve their optimum sitting posture. Um, I use the term optimum here because um, in some cases, especially with really complex uh, presentations, we might not achieve this good, perfect gold standard sitting position. So it's a bit of a compromise there to achieve their optimum sitting posture um, to really um, correct what we can, but also accommodate then any um, fixed postures to reduce the risk of those deteriorating. We break um, the need for specialist seating. So the three types of individuals that we need to be thinking about are those who will lack the physical ability to change position themselves, those who lack the cognitive awareness to know that they need to change position, and those who lack the communication skills to convey that they might be uncomfortable and need to change position. Um, and the reason why we're breaking it down into these three individuals, because it's not necessarily having to focus on those in front of us who um, appear to already have significant postural challenges. What we want to do is identify the need, risk assess to make sure that we are getting specialist seating and other postural equipment in, in a timely manner so that we aren't faced with really complex postures. What we want to do is reduce those instances from happening. So identify the need, risk assess, and get equipment in in a timely manner. And these are the type of individuals who may, in the future, have difficulty achieving their optimum sitting posture. So CareFlex specialist seating, um, 
We've got, um, uh, there's a link at the end of the presentation that gives you all our CareFlex resources. A really good hub for that is our website. There's a wealth of information on there um, from clinical justification documents if you wanted a bit more around why postural care is needed and why specialist CT can help. Um, lots of information on the projects, assessment of prescription guides, um, and all that's available on the website. We've also got um, a YouTube channel now. Um, as we said, we're recording these webinars. You can access all past webinars on there too. Um, for specialist seating, what we try to do is offer high levels of comfort and support. This is a key objective for us, making sure that people are comfortable in the chair. Regardless of those clinical benefits, if a user isn't comfortable, then they're just simply not going to use that piece of equipment. So we want that consistent compliance. We want to make sure that our chairs are adjustable for the range of functions and accessories that can be tailored um, to individual needs and postural presentations. The flexibility to be able to adjust both left and right sides of the seating system um, to make sure that we can correct or accommodate. We need to think about the pressure care as well um, and how different functions can help with that with tilted space and back angle recline if it's appropriate. Um, a choice of fabrics and colours. Um, we're not touching on it today, but we have done in the past about the aesthetics of the chair. And actually, is this a luxury or is it really important to the prescription? And in certain cases, especially with maybe dementia or um, autism spectrum disorders, the aesthetics, the textures, the fabrics, the colours can actually be really critical to that prescription. So we want to offer a choice um, and independence with that as well. Um, the seating systems are always designed and engineered with support network in mind, so thinking about the family and carers as well, um, because often we do rely on them to utilise equipment safely and correctly, so we want to make it as easy as possible, reducing that dependency and the effort. And then it's not just about the chair, it's about the service beyond that as well, so making sure that, the, that we're able to offer comprehensive assessments, um, through to that aftercare support, not just delivering the chair, but being involved in that setup and handover as well, and any review process that might be needed. So the first section then I mentioned, our most commonly asked questions around the actual chair functions and accessories. So what we're going to do is um, bring the video back up and we're actually going to have a run through some of these functions, really go back to the basics, explain the difference between them, when they may be indicated and actually when they may not be indicated as well. Okay, so the first one then, tilt in space. What is tilt in space, Les? So I've got three of our standard chairs here um, Hydro Tilt, uh, Multi Adjust, and sorry, the Multi Adjust and the Smart Seat Pro. So I'm just going to use the um, Hydro Tilt just to give you a little demonstration of what tilt in space is. So tilt in space, the back to seat angle remains constant. When we, achieve, the posture neutral. Yeah, when we achieve a good transfer into the chair, we don't want to interfere with that, that, that good uh, pelvic uh, positioning. So tilting space is posture neutral. So just tilting the chair back, maintaining the angle at the hip helps to maintain that pelvic stability. Yeah. And that tilted space can be really key for, as I said, for that pelvic stability, but also really good for managing energy levels as well. So we can allow individuals to uh, be tilted back, to rest and recuperate, but then before coming upright again to engage in activities. Um, it can be really helpful for positioning as well, as I yeah. said. So if somebody is hoisted, um, and into that position, uh, we can use that tilting space to utilize gravity to get the pelvis down into the back of the chair. So we're reducing again that, that effort um, and the manual handling that might be involved to get the pelvis right down into the back of the chair and get that initial position in right. Um, another thing it could be really key for is pressure care as well. Uh, so changing the, um, the pressure that's going through specific body sites as you go into different tilt angles. There's also something called um, auto tilt as well. That auto could be an tilt, option. Yeah, it's a regulated motion. So you press the button on a, on a motorized or a power chair, and that would cycle the chair to its range of tilting space over a given period of time. So it, it's um, it, it adds again a holistic solution mm -hmm. really to 
the, the surface you're sitting on, the way that you sit on it, and the, the actual movement of the chair to help with yeah. pressure. Set. And keeping that independence as well, because especially if maybe care calls are an issue, um, and actually getting people in to change individuals' positioning, that all to tilt can have people to maintain their independence at home, um, and they can um, operate that as they're able to with, with the controls. Yeah, and, and also the independence um, team there, we can integrate the chairs into environmental control systems as well. Yeah, brilliant. That's a good point. Now, it's worth mentioning with Tilted Space, one question we do get asked is, is it suitable for everyone? Uh, well, no, it's not actually. Tilted Space, along with some of the other functions we're going to cover, um, we have to be risk assessed. We have to make sure that it's appropriate and safe for the individual that's using it. When it comes to Tilted Space, there are times that it could be contraindicated or we need to make sure it's being monitored carefully because there are precautions with that. Um, three kind of key things that are at the top of those lists are those who have swallow difficulties so somebody has dysphagia if speech and language therapy involved that tilt that posterior tilt um, could cause issues with um, especially if they've got pooling of saliva or there's a risk of aspiration there or choking um, so it might be um, uh, important to discuss that with speech and language therapy because there might be certain angles that they have to achieve um, after meal times or before meal times, during meal times, something that can help with that is on the Smart C Pro 2, um, which is a great addition and a great function um, for safety specifically to make sure we're really prescriptive with that with that sleeping solution. Um, but the tilted space inclinometer, which gives us then the actual angle of tilt. So when we do it our handover, especially speech and language therapy involves that MDT approach and making sure that um, the care plan shows what angles are needed at what times. Yeah, it, it's a gauge and uh, the tilting space range on, on the, on the uh, Smarty Pro 2 is 35 degrees. So kind of in recognition of what Rebecca has just said, we thought it was important to include yeah. a feature to help monitor and um, use tilting space in a more specific yeah. measured way. And that's the standard as well, because that's really important and that tilting space, making sure it's safe. Another instance is those who use catheters, depending if it's quite an extreme tilt angle, there can be issues with backflow. So that's another thing to be mindful of um, and the need to monitor. And then also those who might need the use of a tray. So of course, when the tray is on the chair, when we tilt it, it does affect the angle of the tray. So if people use it, um, use it for communication devices um, and so on, or, or PEC systems, then we just need to be mindful of that because it will alter the angle of the tray as well. Yeah, uh, we tend to call it true tilt in space so that when we tilt the chair back, we maintain the angle at the hip, but the arms remain constant as well. On some forms of tilt in space, you have tilt in space with the center of a chair, typically on a rising recline chair, but the center portion of the chair tilts, but the arms remain in the same position. So you have that kind of effect. That's my modeling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so again, just be really careful with tilt in space, make sure it is safe and appropriate. So how, another question we get asked is, how does that differ to back angle recline? Um, so I guess the easiest way for me to show you that would be with our multi-adjust chair. Here's my interview. And I'm gonna take the arm off the chair. So just to recap, tilt in space, the back to seat angle remains constant, doesn't change. Back angle recline does what it says on the tin, the back angle of the chair moves separately. Sometimes again on a rising recline chair, those are linked movements. So as you tilt the chair back, the back angle opens that can cause us some issues for certain clients. Now, back angle recline can be really helpful, again, for energy management, because it allows that period of relaxation and um, energy um, um, conservation to be able to then engage in activities. Um, it might be indicated for users who do have um, limitations to hip flexion, so they might not actually be able to achieve that, uh, that gold standard 90 hip position, so we need to open up the back angle to be able to accommodate that reduced range at the hips. Um, it can be really important for as well for bariatric clients, plus size population, um, especially if they've got that abdominal shelf, you might need to just open up the hip angle for comfort reasons to take pressure away from the abdomen. Perhaps we can show some of the limitations, but 
to, to be aware of. Yeah. Perhaps with lateral support. You want to yeah, on just going on. So the next question we get asked is about when shouldn't it be used? So same with tilt in space. We need to be really mindful, um, again, to risk assess, make sure it's appropriate, um, because it can actually tilt in space as long as we make sure we're safe with things like the catheter um, and swallow difficulties. Because it's posture neutral in terms of somebody's posture stability, um, it can actually be a good function to achieve um, the energy management and pressure care that we mentioned, but there are with back under recline for me, um, it's one of those functions that's probably the most used inappropriately and it can have the biggest impact on their postural stability and actually negate all our hard work we've done. So back under recline is one of those key ones to make sure it's appropriate. And if it's not, there's no need to over prescribe, um, even go for a chair that doesn't have back under recline, like the hydro tilt, or find a way to lock it off and maybe Les can run through that shortly. Um, but yeah, the cases where back and recline can be an issue is with laterals, as Les said. Um, to pop in the yeah. Chair. So we've got a contoured back on this chair. Let's just give the back a hand rest as well. So as I tilt the chair back, posture neutral, you know, affecting pelvic stability. Ignore the leg rest at the moment. We know we're setting something correctly. It's not right. Yeah. Not right. <laughs> um, you can see the laterals remain. In a, in a constant position. Now, I just tilt the chair back slightly. If I open a back angle recline, you can see, or perhaps you can't quite make it up. This lateral has the effect of creeping up underneath the arm. That's quite uncomfortable. It's now up under. And because of the type of individual they work with who might need lateral support, they probably can't readjust. So when the back then comes back upright, it's just going to cause that crunching sensation because you can't um, reposition. Because what, ideally, what we'd want them to do is to be able to do this and the laterals fall in the right place, but they don't. So what ended up then is that assessment, that really comprehensive assessment we've done, where we've identified where the lateral support is needed is now totally the wrong place. Um, so if, um, again, if, if an individual is in settings where maybe there's a lack of confidence in the ability to reposition or to readjust lateral support, then maybe stick to tilt in the space if it's appropriate to achieve those objectives. Um, or um, if you are confident as part of that handle, which is making it very clear that somebody needs to reposition after using back angle recline or that the lateral supports need to be readjusted, the external lateral supports. Um, another thing to be mindful of with back angle recline is pelvic stability. Um, so if somebody really lacks that pelvic stability and that postural control, as I said, to be able to reposition, um, and especially if they've got the added challenge of having an extensor thrust, um, this extensor pattern, um, what we can do, um, those involuntary movements as well, sometimes when we open up the hip angle, we can see that tone shoot, shoot through the roof. And then what we do then is it's just create this sacral sitting, the shear and friction down the chair because they just lack that pelvic stability. So if somebody, for example, with um, CP who has this strong extensor thrust, again, back angle recline might not be the best um, function for them because we want to uh, accommodate the hip range movement and have it set up at that position so it's not altered. Otherwise, we can just see tone shoot, shoot through the roof, totally negates the hard work we've done with the posture and get that shear and friction down the chair. So there are some things that can be done to, yeah. to lock it off. So uh, I'll show you perhaps the, 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 the kind of neatest solution that we have on the Smart Seat Pro 2. You can see quite a complex chair, multi-adjustable back section. So when we set the chair up for an individual, it's quite specific. Um, you know, adjusting the back angle without, uh, without a plan, so to speak, can really affect, adversely affect, the way that the laterals work on the back of the chair. So, on both the, uh, the multi-adjust and the smart seat pro for back angle recline, we have a locking lever. So, tilt in space, I just come along, squeeze the lever, reposition and release. Back angle recline, it, it's, it's asking me to do two things. It's asking me to squeeze, but I need to release this lock as well here. So I release the lock, allows me to squeeze the handle, adjust, release, and you'll hear it click, click back into place. So that's a standard feature on both chairs, but you can guarantee somebody will still perhaps override that feature, not understanding fully the impact of adjusting back angle recline. So one of the things we also do is to disconnect the lever. 
So we part of the setup process, we establish the optimum back angle recline for our individual, we set it, we would then remove the handle and just stow it inside the spine of the chair, put the cover back on the top. So the care when they use the chair, it's all they'll see is tilting space. In effect, it becomes a tilting space only chair with the back angle locked away. Thank you, Les. So another question we get asked is about the leg rest. Um, what does it do and how can it help? There are different types of, especially on, on some of our chairs, there are different options with the leg rest, whether there's a negative angle, an elevating leg rest. Um, so I don't want to show um, maybe the negative angle. Yeah, I'll show you the negative angle on the approach you again. Position the chair. So now leg rests are important because as we know with any form of postural care, we need to target all those body segments. So of course the pelvis is the foundation for sitting, but we need to target even in sitting, even the feet um, to make sure that we get as much of the person in contact with the chair as possible. And then as part of that assessment, depending on knee range, will dictate what kind of leg rest might be needed. So on the Smart Pro 2, a standard, we have a minus 30 degree negative leg rest. You can see that very well, actually. It's hitting behind the chair now. Yeah. <laughs> what it does is it accommodates if somebody has um, that reduced knee range, the ability to extend the knees, they can tack the leg, then you can see tuck the feet under the chair um, to accommodate that more acute angle. Um, what can be done as well is chamfer in the cushion if needed. Um, just yeah, just bring in the shape of this so we can reduce that angle so there's less, less pressure at the back of the knee. Yeah, and if you look at the foot plate as well, obviously in that position, it's not in a great position. So we can angle the foot plate up as well so that it toes up. Yeah. Uh, the leg rest on the Pro 2 as well articulates. So as you elevate, it grows in, in length to accommodate the full leg length of a client. It's not going to raise your client's legs off the seat surface. Yeah. So through that range from a negative through then that elevating leg rest. Um, with the leg rest, what I would say, because again, we're talking about the chair functions and how suitable they are and how safe and appropriate they are for individuals, um, is just to be mindful, as we said, of somebody's knee range of movement. Um, if somebody has limitations to that knee extension, then they shouldn't be using leg rest elevation. So I don't want to show what exactly happens. Uh, perhaps if we get yeah. you my, my model. <laughs> Magician's assistant. Uh, this is really, when I say common, we, we do see this when people don't understand. I'll give you the right seat there to yeah. start with. I'm going to hoist from back and back under the chair. I'm just going to quickly adjust the seat depth. Right. Yeah, yeah, just drop the foot That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seat depth, okay. Now Rebecca, for the purpose of our little demo, is going to have a limited range of movement at the knees. So, and, and, and we just about at that range at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, what we've got to be very careful of is elevating the leg rest outside that range of movement. So, if I do this. Remember, I can't physically extend. So let's say we are at 90 degrees, mm -hmm. and that's your range of movement. But elevate in order to maintain 90 at the knee. You see what Rebecca's got to do. Yeah. And the next step on that is into a wind sweeping posture. It's the only way she can sit in the chair. And that's because the, the care team, if you like, don't fully understand the mechanics. Mm -hmm. of the way that the leg rest works. So that's a critical thing to understand. Yeah. And as part of our handover being very clear if leg rest elevation is suitable or not. And again, we, we sometimes disconnect the leg rest lever. Uh, but one of the key things that's practical, a little bit of advice, if you're going to disconnect any of the levers, make sure the care team, all the care team know, mm -hmm. because we don't want them to think it's broken. <laughs> So it, it needs to be clearly kind of identified, perhaps in a care plan or on a little note on on, a, on the on the wardrobe door. On, it's being on laminated. The yeah. yeah. Okay. So working the way through the body segments, then down to the feet, and we also get asked as well: Is a foot plate really needed um, in sitting? Well, yeah. 
in sitting, we still have 19% of our body weight going through our feet. So if you don't have foot support, if you're walking into environments where uh, the lovely foot plate is being used as a doorstop or a bookend or sat on top of the wardrobe, um, that individual will have 19% of their body weight added to the pelvis. So they could have 94% of their body weight just going through the pelvis. And then we're wondering why that somebody might be uncomfortable, we might be getting pressure injuries. So foot plate, yeah, fundamental in sitting um, to take that weight. We naturally seek that proprioceptive feedback through our feet. So if the foot plate wasn't there again, we would cause that posterior tilt going into sacral sitting just so somebody can get their feet on the floor and get that stability and feedback that they need to feel secure within the chair. And I, I sometimes as part of an assessment or part of a training session I, I ask people to sit in a chair with and without a foot plate yeah. and to think about how that feels and more often than, than not people comment on how much more comfortable and reassuring yeah. or reassured they feel with the foot plate there. Because you think one of the, not an issue with tilting space but you know, inevitably, if, as you tilt somebody back in the chair, you raise their feet off the floor. So the foot plate comes in and that acts as that floor to yeah. give that feedback. And remember the type of individuals who we might be working with could have those extra challenges of tonal problems of involuntary movements. And if we lack that postural stability, as we said, we can then see all those movements shoot through the roof and it will increase the position within the chair, um, impact on the position within the chair. Um, so different foot plate options in terms of angle adjustability, height adjustability, all these things to think about. Does somebody need a firm support or whether they need something, um, especially if they've got sensory impairments or maybe they react, um, they don't like that um, firm support because they um, react to that, they need something more comfortable. Um, so Les is... Okay. <laughs> the magician bringing out the different uh, support options, somebody might need something. Mr. Ben, yeah. he's from the back of the shop. <laughs> So like if you have somebody with perhaps somebody whose feet are rolling out or in plantar flex and we can't just um, accommodate that foot on a flat surface, the roll out heel, we quite often go for a soft cushion. So just providing a bit of feedback, a bit of support, but nice and soft and allowing the feet to be absorbed, if you like, avoiding any pressure points. Yeah, there's also then the option of if I'm going even further, if somebody has leg length discrepancies um, where you might need um, a tailored solution to be happy to have a stepped foot plate pad to accommodate the differences in um, in the um, in the tibia length. Yeah. So again, that could be something to Rebecca mentioned tailored solutions that are custom made devices. Everything you'll see with us today is a standard off the shelf component, uh, with the exception of something like this, for example. This is my demonstration setup, if you like, and it's just a set of ankle huggers. Or ankle shoes, so we can we can secure these to the footprint on the chair if need be as well. Yeah. So that's that kind of a whiz through of some of the most commonly asked questions we have around specific chair functions and accessories. When you get the presentation sent out to you after the webinar, then and there'll be some more in depth answers there that you can read through. I'm just going to load up the next presentation. This is where we um, get asked about the actual setup of the chair, um, how important um, are the chair dimensions for the individual, things like seat depth, seat width, seat height, arm height, but also um, we get asked as well about plus size considerations, um, bariatric individuals and how that might impact on the chair setup for them. That was really important. Um, I mentioned about the aftercare process. It's not just delivering a chair to you. That setup is actually critical, just as important as that assessment to make sure that the setup is individualized for the user. Um, if it's not set up for them, then it can cause more harm than good. We need to make sure that we support the posture appropriately. We've got maximum contact with the support surface to distribute that weight evenly, whilst also thinking about the comforted independence. So that assessment process through to the description, but then the setup is just as vital. That positioning within the chair dictates how the chair will be used going forward. So the chair's only gonna be as good as that part of the process. Um, so we need to think about their body shape, their size, um, and as I said, set it up for that individual. There's also an added challenge here in multi-user environments. So again, that handover and care plan, um, if that can be laminated and um, easily accessible, um, for someone um, to make sure that um, uh, that's easy to follow between users and care staff are able to follow that. 
the way that we set up the chair does influence, and I keep saying about tonal changes, um, involuntary movements, and all these um, complex postural challenges, the way the setup, as we know, will influence that positioning. Um, so we can increase the risk of secondary complications around that partial deterioration, pressure injuries, and of course, reduce quality of life because of the pain that can come with things like spasticity um, or career, violent career movements. So why is, I don't know if you, actually, if we just show first what we mean by seat depth, seat width, um, really those are the key measurements that we need to think about when it comes to that setup um, and why it might be important. So we just show how we adjust the seat width and the seat depth yeah. on, on the chairs. So seat depth adjustment on a chair with back angle recline, we actually move the back over the seat. A chair like the Hydra Tilt, which is a tilt in space only, we move the seat underneath the back, okay? So to adjust the seat depth on the multi-adjust, there's a little lever the lever at the back of the chair. It, you may not get the detail of the the, um, the clarity, if you like, with, with the webcam at the moment. But if you need to review any of the ways in which I'm adjusting the chairs, if you go to our website, there's a series of how-to videos which will give you a much better view of what I'm actually doing here. But just to show, it's, it's really easy to adjust the chairs. Push the lever down. And I just push the back in to decrease the seat depth and towards me to increase the seat depth. Did I get another round? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and that just locks off, it'll lock that in place. And it's the same on every, well, virtually every chair, with the exception of the hydro tilt where we just change a saddle arm. So we take the arm off and put a different arm onto the chair. If we show you, so if it is the seat depth is just too long for someone, which is not difficult with my legs, um, that the longer seat depth. Yeah. Yeah. So what can happen is um, we obviously, the seat depth is in the wrong place now because the back of my knee is on top of the cushion. So to be able to bend, to physically bend my knees, to necessarily naturally seek that proprioceptive feedback through our feet, to be able to bend my knees over the cushion, is pulling me down into that sacral sitting. So I don't have any damage to my body systems, but something as simple as a seat depth has caused me to go into that sacral sitting just so I can get my feet supported. So if I go to uh, a, a seat depth that's too small? Yep. And the difference then, the issue that this poses, is obviously we've got half of my thigh now not being supported. So going back to pressure care, we've obviously got increased pressure going through um, going through the pelvis and increasing that risk of, um, of, of um, pressure injuries, but also the postural stability as well, because it feels like I'm perched, if anyone is perched on bar stools, it feels like I'm perching and I'm not fully secure and stable within the chair, so that can affect, again, and influence um, the tone and movement and active movement. One thing you've never done is perch on a bar stool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, seat width then is important because again, just going back to that postural stability, seeking that support. If something is too wide for us, especially if we lack that postural control and postural stability, if something is too wide. Oh, you do the seat <laughs> You're going too quick. Thank you. What can happen is again, what we might see is that rotation, the pelvic obliquity happening, seeking that support at the pelvis and when we, we get a lean that goes with that because remember the pelvis dictates what happens above and below so again just from the seat width even if there's no known postural challenges or damage to the body systems we are causing this just because of the seat width because if somebody's seeking that support um, just to feel comfortable and then we're causing the, the lateral flexion as well so really important seat depths seat widths and the chair dimensions are set up for the individual um, seat height options are obviously all different depending on what kind of chair you go you go with um, and sit on the seat, seat the floor height. Yeah. You say seat the floor, but what we really mean is the seat, the foot plate height, more often than, than not. And you can adjust the length of the foot plate for taller clients. That'll ratchet up. Maybe though that we have somebody in semi ambulance and you can stand to walk with assistance when prompted. So we can set uh, the multi adjust, for example, the, yeah, the multi adjust so that it tilts ever so slightly forward. It'll bring your client's feet onto the floor to help assist with the stand 
assist transfer. Um, when you get the presentation out, there'll be a bit on there about arm height as well and why that might be important. Um, if somebody does have a fixed scoliosis, for example, um, and maybe the arm rests um, are, are um, the arm height, sorry, are different on each side, then something like the multi just might be needed because you can adjust the arm height tool free um, to to accommodate that. Um, but again, as I said, there'll be a bit more information on the presentation we send out. When it comes to plus size individuals, um, when we get asked about how that affects setup. Um, it's really thinking about the gluteal shelf. Um, and so at the back of the bottom, because that could obviously impact on the seat depth that's needed. So we're not necessarily going um, to the same point as we would on those who don't have that gluteal shelf. We might need to accommodate that. But sometimes um, something like a waterfall back could be the option for that because yeah. you can remove some padding so we can still get the seat depth right for the individual. And then we can remove some padding at the lumbar section of the waterfall to accommodate that gluteal yeah. shelf. And we, we just got to be careful that we consider lateral support of the waterfall back as well because historically a waterfall back is very, very comfortable. It immerses somebody with that kind of... Uh, slightly kyphotic profile, but we tend to sometimes miss the lateral support that's needed. So we do an option with the extra large height, which is called it a laterally contoured waterfall back. So it's shaped to keep that person in that midline. Yeah. And um, there's also um, might have to think about the um, extra weight on the calves as well, um, and making sure that the leg rest is, is, is comfortable for them. Uh, I might need to actually increase the, um, the foot plate length to accommodate that if they feet need to sit forward so there's some extenders you yeah. can have. Okay, the example of a, of a, of a tailored solution, mm -hmm. you know, we, we try to make the chairs as adaptable as possible, but we do meet some quite unique individuals with some quite unique postures. So yeah. we need to have the ability to, to, to provide a bespoke uh, solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as again, get a lot more information. Another thing as well is that there is a Hydro Tilt XL, um, a larger yeah. version. So a larger version of the, um, the medium chair that you see here. That will go up to a 35 stone, 250 kilo weight limit and a 650, 65 centimetre, 26 inch seat width. And that's powered and standard, powered, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that's obviously key then as part of the support network, thinking about how daily life um, will be to make sure we reduce that dependency and effort as well. Okay, so the next thing we have is around um, specific conditions. Now, when you get the presentation, um, these are all going to be set out in individual um, sections for each condition. But for the purpose of um, the presentation, just so that we can um, run through the postural challenges, um, and generally because even if somebody has a stroke, um, two individuals are not going to present the same way. There's going to be a whole host of different postural challenges um, and how that stroke affects them. The same with cerebral palsy and all the different types of cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, depending on the area of the brain uh, where that's happened. Um, we don't focus because we're trying to be holistic. Um, what we mean by that is there's not a narrow focus on the diagnosis, especially when it comes to postural care. It doesn't really matter it, other than thinking about maybe the prognosis of the condition and how that might impact on future equipment but actually what we want to do is see the individual in front of us um, and think about them as a whole and address the postural challenges not the condition um, or the diagnosis. So what I've done is highlight some of the uh, common postural challenges um, that somebody um, with any of these conditions could present with. Um, there could be an element of pain, could be an element of fatigue, the postural instability and our lack of postural control and um, there could be involuntary movements. So again, depending on the diagnosis, they could be choreic movements like in Huntington's disease. Maybe somebody has ataxic movements um, or um, uh, that extensor thrush that we, that we mentioned. There could be tonal changes. Um, somebody with cerebral palsy could have spasticity, so they have high tone, um, whereas we might be working with individuals with muscle weakness and paralysis if there's been a stroke, for example. Individuals who have long-term conditions, especially where postural care and that risk hasn't been identified in a timely manner, they could have developed contractures and deformities, things like increased thoracic kyphosis, um, reduced range of movement at the hips and knees, uh, scoliosis, uh, foot deformities, wind sweeping, and these are things that as part of the assessment that we need to um, decide whether we can correct or whether we can accommodate. Individuals might have sensory impairment, so they might have lack of that proprioceptive feedback to know where they are in space. 
um, and we need to make sure that we um, uh, give them the, the feedback that they need to remain stable within the chair, but also to manage some of those um, sensory challenges as well. Somebody might have reduced physiological function. Um, any individual with any diagnosis could have impaired cognitive function. Um, and because of the challenges with achieving their optimum sitting posture, if there's no alternative seating in place, they could have limited interaction engagement because they can become confined to their bed uh, and the four walls of their room. So these are common postural challenges that we get asked about. But when you get the presentation, I, we've broken it down into each condition for you. So you can um, think about it in that way, especially if you work in a specific um, specialty. What we wanted to do was maybe just run through some of the postural support options that can help manage some of these so that we meet in all the objectives um, for, for seating prescription. So thinking about comfort, thinking about um, energy management, um, thinking about their postural support within the chair, that pelvic stability and so on. Uh, because remember when it comes to specialist seating, what we want to do is make sure that we are, as part of the assessment, deciding if we can correct um, or whether we need to accommodate. That's probably the simplest question we need to ask yeah, as part of our assessment. It's a key thing for myself as a seating assessor to know uh, whether, you know, what we're actually trying to accommodate or correct, as Rebecca says, because it'll really impact on the initial choice of chair we use for the assessment. Yeah. We'll get there eventually, but the quickest and most efficient and um, cleanest way to get there is, is to have as much information prior to the assessment yeah. as possible. So as clinicians, we do our postural assessment and we come to that seating assessment and work in combination with the seating assessor to come up with the seating solutions. Um, we are the, should be the expert on the person knowing the problem list and then you bring in the chair expertise then and mix that together to get the right seating solution. Um, so when we're talking about energy management, we've said about tilt and space can be helpful as appropriate back angle recline. And a key part of managing energy um, is that somebody feels safe and comfortable within the chair so that their body segments can work efficiently together. Um, postural instability. Now, this is what's key, and we've probably said it quite a few times already, when we think about tonal changes, when we think about involuntary movements and somebody's ability to remain safe in the chair, that comes down to postural stability. Um, one thing we haven't touched on yet is pelvic positioning aids, uh, pelvic belts, groin harnesses, chest harnesses. Yeah, so, so we can fit um, pelvic belts to all of the chairs. Um, broad um, difference, if you like, is one for uh, safety and security. So perhaps if you're moving uh, a resident from a third floor um, bedroom down to the lounge through the lift round a a corridor with an uneven floor, you may just want to be using a pelvic belt just for security. When we get to the lounge, the pelvic belt comes away. Positioning aids, though, we're looking at something a little bit more specific and something a little bit more supportive. Um, Four-point pelvic strap, a padded pelvic strap, a groin harness, a chest harness. Um, if you're using a chest harness, maybe you always would need to use a yeah. pelvic belt as yeah. well or a groin harness just because of the risk of asphyxiation there if somebody slips down the chair. Um, and, and while Les has mentioned that, when you get the presentation, um, there is a medical device safety alert around positioning aids um, to make sure that they are used safely and appropriately because everyone who provides them and uses them has a responsibility. So there's a link there for further reading as well, just to cover yourselves as part of that handover um, because they are not there for restrictive purposes. Um, it's there to, um, to support somebody's posture. Yeah, yeah. We, we're looking for the least restrictive solution possible. But there's that blurred line with restrictive and supportive. So we need to understand the, the difference between both. Yeah. Um, so there are going to be some, and again, it's going to be a bit more information because I realise we've been limited, limited with the time we have with you. Um, but there's a bit more information on the presentation about when belts and harnesses could be indicated, um, when we need to be careful, we need to have precautions, or there might be contraindications in place, um, and um, and then how to do that appropriately, um, because there's no blanket approach when it comes to position aids, and we have to take it very, very seriously. It is probably the um, the most um, um, risk risky part of specialist seating, but in some cases, especially things by like um, cerebral palsy, yeah. there are cases where if somebody didn't have that pelvic belt, Huntington's disease as well, if they didn't have a groin harness in some cases, um, they could be flipping the chair. The chair yeah. They could be out of the chair and causing injury. So the, the, the phrase I like to use is, is best interest. Really. Yeah. You, you know, if, 
sometimes the only way that a person can use a chair safely and effectively is with the use of a pelvic strap or a groin harness. Yeah. And again, lots of issues around consent and things as well. I mean, if somebody has capacity and able to consent, then that's a lot easier to have that chat with them and hopefully get them on board and they can agree to it. Um, but as Les said, in some cases where somebody lacks that capacity to consent, um, to specifically about um, utilising a position in aid, then we might need to have an MDT approach around the best interest for that. Yeah. Um, so pelvic belts, playing kind of position in aid, great for posture stability, but it's always, we always need to start with the least restrictive option first, which would be the tilt in space if that's appropriate, and then working our way up to the pelvic belt. Something else that can help is a ramped cushion. Um, yeah. Uh, an example. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> back with a shot. So as I said, least restrictive option first, trial in, see if tilt and space can help, moving up to a ramped cushion and then up to positioning aids. So an example again of, of a tailored solution, although this is becoming much more of a standard option, you can see the ramp front edge of the seat here and the slightly contoured front edge, so acting as that kind of little bit of an inbuilt pommel to prompt that midline posture again. So we've covered a bit around kind of mild um, to moderate posture or positions where we can correct postures. Um, we can get somebody into the chair like the hydro tilt, contoured back, um, even a waterfall back, just to give some gentle lateral feedback, but they're able to maintain their own sitting upright posture within the chair. They just need um, uh, the extra functions so, such as tilt and space, for example, to be able to manage energy. But then when we move in towards more complex postures, those with the contractures and deformities that we mentioned, um, we that it might need to work our way up then through things like the multi just or the Smart Seat Pro 2. Um, should we cover um, kyphosis? Yeah. yeah. Perhaps my, my, my go to chair, if you like, with us for, for a kyphosis would possibly be or probably be the Smart Seat Pro 2. Um, I just run through the back section because I'm mindful of time. Yeah. And again, if you need more information on, 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 on the product, if you go to the website, you'll see that we have quite a, um, a, we have a launch video there for it, which will run through its features and benefits. Plus, it'll explain to you how I'm actually adjusting the chair. Yeah. While you're talking about that, uh, we might as well just talk about scoliosis as well. Um, if, you, um, if some of these terms are new to you, um, so we're going to go back to the basics. Um, we have got a webinar um, that was done last September that introduced some of these postural challenges. And um, we've also got um, a postural challenge booklet on our website as well that goes into a lot more detail around the different body segments um, and explains what these things might be. But kyphosis, if you imagine thoracic region, increased curvature um, with um, at, at that part of the spine. And then what you get is the line of vision towards the ground um, and gradually gravity can take it over and make that kyphosis worse. A scoliosis, we're talking about that lateral movement, so it could be an S curve or a C curve of the spine. And then depending on the complexity, you might need then a multi-adjustable um, lateral point back support like this. So again, if we, I'll, I'll show you how the back system works. Um, we have the client with the kyphosis in mind as I go through this. So uh, we, I think it's five points of movement on each section of the back. I've got height adjustment, the taller client, I've got lateral rotation. adjustment or rotation, sorry, rotation for a fixed posture, I can change the pitch, bring that back and lock that off, I will just show you what I'm doing here. Offset then as well. Scoliosis, we just loosen the back section off there. And then we need to turn that back and forth. But in particular, if you think of my client with a kyphosis, and it's a fixed posture, so you know, ideally we like to get somebody back into the chair, but I've got to take the support surfaces of the chair out to my client, my service user, my customer. So taking it back then to the real fundamentals that we said. Can we correct or do we need to accommodate? If we can correct, then we can bring the individual to the chair. If we need to accommodate, we need to think of ways to bring the chair to the individual. I'll bring that forward. These are actually extended brackets. They're not standard brackets. We were working with a client the other day who was really, really kyphotic and really going forward. So we're using tilted space. We really needed to get the, the support service, the head section out to that client. Then I can just draw. And there's a certain level of adjustment for the rest of the back to almost cocoon and provide support for that client. 
one thing that can be really good for um, kyphosis is an anterior support. Um, again, it just comes, comes back to that proprioceptic feedback and feel, again, that stability within the chair, but sometimes an anterior support to encourage them to, um, to come away from the, the anterior of the chair can sometimes work better than tilting space, because uh, some individuals can fight against the tilting space. You might see that kyphosis is worse as they try and fight away from that. Uh, so anterior support can, can sometimes be really helpful for an uh, uh, increased thoracic kyphosis. So we've got lateral support built into the chair as well. Uh, standard second shear thoracic, or you could add additional laterals to the chair. You can see the shape of the lateral, it's, it's an ergonomic shape, it kind of grips just with the ribs here, so it gives you a little bit more support than the standard lateral. It's, it's quite a comfortable support surface as well, and that would just pop back into the chair here on the side and put a bracket on. Uh, perhaps a scoliosis. We call it a kidney pad, so really spreading pressure over, over a really wide area and just sitting in here and perhaps coming into that S or C shape to yeah. provide support. Um, we've got to think as well the potential of the person sitting in this chair with a kyphosis may be having a wind sweeping posture as well. So, bottle, a standard on the chair fits centrally, but if you've got somebody who's wind sweeping and it's a fixed posture and we're looking to accommodate that person in this chair, you need to offset the pommel so the bracket that it fits into can be moved left and right and we can again adjust where that bracket sits on the front edge of the chair. So if I'm going to move my lateral and my pommel off center, I need to reposition the head of the pommel as well, so it's running flush with that person's leg, not a corner across it. You just need to be flush across the leg. Yeah, that comes down to the pressure care then as well. So that's a quick whiz through of some of the um, contractures and deformities and where we might need to accommodate postures instead of correcting them. Um, as I said, lots of information on the website if you wanted more about more information around those um, and lots of other webinars in the past as well where we focus on these specific conditions. Um, but these are really just the basic common questions that we get asked about um, and what can be what, what will help a scoliosis, what will help a, help a kyphosis and so on. So let's just go to the final presentation. And we get asked a lot about our pressure care. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have water cell technology um, within our chairs. Um, so we get asked around um, what exactly water cell is um, and how specialist seating from Careflex can help. In the simplest of terms, specialist seating aims to reduce the risk of pressure injury by distributing um, the individual's weight throughout the chair um, as much as possible. So as much of the person in contact with the chair as possible to disperse that, that weight distribution. This opportunity to sit out can offer this much needed regular change of position as well. So we can utilize tilt in space if it's appropriate um, to encourage blood flow and redistribute pressure. The key thing about around pressure care um, when we're talking about seating considerations is getting that optimum position in right to start with. So as much of the person in contact with the chair as possible. Um, making sure we have that equal weight distribution. So we're correcting or accommodating where possible. We need to get the correct chair set up right. So we've shown you things like seat depth and seat width and why that could be important. Appropriate use of functions. Again, thinking about opening up at the back angle when it's not appropriate, causing that shear and friction because they're sliding down the chair. So we need to make sure that there's appropriate use of functions in that handover as well. But the main thing, the research shows when it comes to pressure care, um, in any part of 70 to 24 hours is regular repositioning. So there's no good achieving this gold standard perfect posture, but then maintaining it for 10 hours because we're still increasing the pressure um, over a long period. So when we have prolonged periods without changing position, that's where we can start seeing cells at them because they lack the, the nutrients, that blood flow um, uh, to those cells and we can get pressure ulcers. So it's regular repositioning. So the chair forms part of that 24 hour program and somebody might need to go back to bed for a period of time um, or they might have um, specific third party cushions as well. So something we do is a, like a docking cushion as well. Yeah. Docking cushion, another example of a yeah. tailored solution, um, which would secure the third party cushion yeah. 
onto the seat, uh, onto the seat base, not on top of the seat cushion, onto the seat base, so you don't have any gaps and it's yeah. held in place, it doesn't move around on the chair. Yeah, so we never put cushions on top of cushions. Um, we have to make sure that the cushion is integrated within the chair. If somebody has, if tissue by building bond and they do have a third party, um, but if you wanted to know more about water cell technology, then we've um, uh, we've got um, clinical research has been published by the University of Salford on it. Um, there's um, information as well on pressure mapping. Um, so you can just see on the image there what we're aiming to achieve is a more equal weight distribution of red areas, high pressure areas, or initial tuberosities, whereas we're trying to disperse like the top image. Um, but if you wanted some handouts or some PDFs on water cell technology, especially for clinical justifications, um, then again, that's all on the website. We can get in touch with us and we can share, um, share the University of Salford research. Um, but just be mindful that if somebody does have a third party, um, it can be integrated into our chairs. Um, so there's no, no concerns there. What I wanted to finish with um, is really just a, um, a quick method of trying to remember everything we've gone through today. So when, when we're doing a seating assessment, when we're doing our prescription, just think about the chair. So we've got compromise. So we need to make sure that sometimes it's not about this perfect posture. We might need to compromise to make sure that individuals are compliant, because ultimately, if they don't use the chair, we're not going to achieve our clinical objectives anyway. So we might need to compromise, uh, make sure that they are comfortable and happy with the chair, the support network can use the chair appropriately, and that we are achieving our clinical objectives as well. So compromise, that's the C. The H, always be holistic. So we need to make sure we're putting the individual and the support network at the centre, because again, making sure we have um, consistent compliance with the piece of equipment um, to make sure that the chair is ultimately used as it's supposed to be used. The A, do we accommodate or do we need to correct? Um, that's just the fundamental as part of that postural assessment, finding out what the body segment limitations are um, and making sure the seating solutions um, allow those things to happen. We need to put the individual, um, and this is really about daily life for them, what their individual um, daily life is like across that full 24 hours, what we need, what do they want the chair to do? Um, Les always likes to say about setting expectations yeah. um, before, before going key, out. Yeah, because um, just, just a little anecdote, you know, if, if you're, we supply a chair into a nursing home for a resident who's been bed bound for a long period of time, you know, what, what, are, what are the aspirations of the care team and the family of how long that gentleman is going to sit out mm -hmm. initially in the chair? It may be building up a, a tolerance, 20 minutes up to 40, up to an hour. That, that gentleman isn't going to sit in that chair all day on the first day that he gets that chair. So it's kind of understanding expectations of the user, key, but of the care team as well mm -hmm. and the family. Yeah. Well, because we need to think about what they want to achieve with it. If you're working more with uh, maybe it's an individual who lives at home with parents um, and the most important part of their day is helping in the kitchen, helping their mother in the kitchen, or helping their father in the kitchen or their siblings. Um, so actually a key part of that for them is having a tray. Now, if we were to go into that assessment and not know what they wanted to do in that chair, that tray could be forgotten about and not actually prescribed. And then we've taken away the best part of the day. So are they really going to be compliant with that piece of equipment? Ask the individual what you need this chair to do um, um, as part of your daily life. Um, and, what, and then how can we allow that through different functions and accessories? It could be that an individual... Um, who has a new diagnosis of MS um, and they're still independent at home, um, working from home. So um, Les mentioned it about environmental controls, allowing them to be able to do that from, from the comfort of the specialist seating system. And then the R is the repeat. So thinking about repeating that over the 24 hours um, and how that slots in then again. Um, so just always bring it back to this. It's just a really quick key um, checklist to think about, am I answering all those questions? Because it's not just, I mean, it's strange, I'm a physio, strange for me to say it's not just about somebody's posture. Um, obviously, that's a key element of it and a key seat in consideration. But actually, as a whole, we need to make sure that the individual, we have this holistic approach, we're compromising where we need to. Um, we're accommodating or correcting posture, but it fits into that 24 hours and this repeatable um, long term for them so that we can ultimately achieve those clinical objectives. I mentioned about the clinical um, the CareFlex resources, um, lots of stuff available. Those of you who might already have the encyclopedia specialist seating or the pocketbook of seating that can be used as a reference guide out in the field. Lots of case studies on the, web, on the website. 
we've got a YouTube channel now. So any other information you need um, from an educational point of view, or we've got finally going out and about again now, yeah. doing face to face, face um, to face presentations yeah. and um, demonstrations. Yeah. 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 So I guess back on screen, you can see us chatting to you. There we go. So I don't know how we managed it, but we just about managed to finish just about on time, which is. Uh, yeah, for us, that's pretty good. good. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is a massive subject. Yeah. It's a fascinating subject, and we could be here for days, weeks, months if we really went into depth. Um, we've just shared with you the resources that we have available to back up today's presentation. Um, Jess, I don't know if you have any questions, any burning requirements for knowledge. Um, so we had a question asking, what time scale does the auto tilt work through its range and can that also be set for the individual person? It's, it's preset. Uh, there are two buttons on the handset. It can either be one hour or eight hours. Um, whenever the chair is, whenever you want to um, interrupt that movement, you just grab the handset and you just press the button to, to stop that movement. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's like half a degree yeah. every 20 seconds. The movement it's not is, degrees or something, I think yeah, it's, it's fairly imperceptible for the person sitting in the chair, but it'll go completely back to, to, to 30 degrees and back up, but it won't, sorry, it won't go to upright. It'll, it'll come back up to, I think it's 15 degrees. So the movement is between 50 to 30 degrees back and forth. If we brought somebody upright, worry a little bit that they may feel a little bit, um, and, and, and safe yeah. in the chair. But if, um, if you want to take the contact details, Jess, and if you want more, more information on that, we can yeah, we'll get the actual the spec on it, yeah. That's great. And another question we had is, can we add stump balls to our chairs? Yes, as a tailored solution, um, we, we, we could do that. That's an easy one to answer. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I believe that's all of our questions for today. Okay, well, if that's the case, if you have any um, queries after the event, after we finish here today, you can get hold of myself or Rebecca, yeah. um, info at careflex.co.uk, uh, and we'll come back to you as quickly as we can. Yeah. So, and the presentation will set out all these questions yeah. that we've gone through today with a bit more in-depth of information for further reading as well. Um, um, but yeah, if anything, if you get that presentation, there's any more queries, and yeah, just get in touch with us. So thank you for attending. Um, I'll bring the presentation to an end and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.